Well, again, my dear brothers and sisters, isn't this a different reading than one we just had in our previous section? And they're all just along the pages of this record of uh, Elisha's work. And it makes it a really attractive uh, area of scripture, I think, with quite a few uh, things that are not easy to understand. And uh, that's a good challenge anyway. And what about this one? It's only seven verses, and yet it's a priceless little part of the record of Scripture, isn't it? I think we've always enjoyed this. Even when we were at Sunday school, we had to learn about the, the pot of oil that saved this little family. And there's a pot of oil, my dear brothers and sisters, and it alone can save our families. The obvious uh, sense of this whole section comes way down, doesn't it, from battles with three kings and all of the bloodshed that was involved in the destruction of Moab and it comes right down to a domestic sphere. There's a single woman. She's a single woman because she's lost her husband and she's got two children. So he had the whole scope of different things that come upon us in our ecclesial life. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets. Not even told her name, aren't we? Quite often that's the case in Scripture that as a woman we don't even know her name. I wonder who that lady was who put that pence into the Jerusalem temple funds. And it rattled down and it was, Jesus says, she has given more than all. Don't know her name, do we? There's something to look forward to. We don't know the name of this lady, but probably we will. She's going to be there, I'm sure. So she cried unto Elisha. I commend her for that. She might have thought, this man's in too big a thing to worry about just me. But she didn't. Because she believed that Elisha had the spirit and power of Elijah working with him now. And she took her domestic problem to someone as important as that. When sisters do that, and if any of you are in that similar circumstance, I commend you and I think, keep it up. That's what your brethren are there for. Have the courage to go forward and find a private moment, no doubt, where you can have a good talk about the things that are really worrying you and see if that can help. Don't just spare them by yourselves. The sister had the courage to cry, it says. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear Yahweh. That's her, her deceased husband. He was a good member of the school of the prophets. He was a nice brother, a firm brother, a brother you could rely upon. Something happened, like does. Happens over the last five years, ten years. It seems to me that it's happening more and more cases of serious illness per hundred people I think seem to be occurring. Do you feel the same way? I do. But I think, brothers and sisters, that it means too that we're living in an age that can fix so, up so much in terms of health and difficulties. But I think that in the latter part of our, our pilgrimage, things are going to be like that. It's an uphill battle. When Armageddon comes, it comes at the end of a road. And there will be all kinds of experiences which you and I have gone through that we may not have gone through, but we may not be the worst for it. It's what it does for our faith, isn't it? It's important. I could list a dozen things in the last month, perhaps in the last week or two. We've had some very grave matters of concern here which have shaken the suburbs of Ecclesiastes uh, in Australia very, very, solid, very solidly, very much. 
a young man that was in a crash like that. How did he ever get through that? Hard to understand, isn't it? Written off virtually by medical people. Anyone who saw the crash thought there's just absolutely no hope for that person. The nature of the crash. Incredible. How do we understand that? And yet he's making good progress day by day. Silently, quietly. And we're all praying that more will come. And we're learning because of it too. And our young people perhaps are learning from it. Because they realise that life is a very wonderful thing. So it's not all loss, my dear brothers and sisters. I don't know how many just this today have come to me and said that they've got this about their left knee or something or other about their right hip. Mine's not the right one, it's the left one. <laughs> but we're, we're all getting something or other that uh, we never used to have before. But it's not necessarily against us as far as the kingdom is concerned and our reception at the hands of Christ. And uh, I just hope that all of our arranging brethren and those that are senior can take home the desire to look after people in our meetings so that our ecclesias are really happy places where people know they will get support and they have the confidence that their arranging brethren or others in their meeting they know well will open their door and their heart to them. Because we will need that. Perhaps that's what God is teaching us. It's not just your children, just your even grandchildren. Pretty special things, aren't they? But it's not just yours or mine that's important. It's all the children in the meeting, all the families in our ecclesias. We're out to save them with God's help. Well, this woman had the sense to cry. In the... Exodus chapter 22 is a verse that's very apt. It's right here in the beginning of the law. Exodus 22 and 22. It's a very apt quotation. She almost fits it to the, to the letter. Exodus 22, 22. Ye shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If thou afflict them in any wise, and they cry at all unto me, I will surely hear their cry. That's a very beautiful part of the law, isn't it? Don't go past the child that's lost a parent, that's in need of extra support. And make sure that our children are of the same mind so that we are actually picking that person up and doing us all a lot of good because of it. If thou afflict them in any wise, that doesn't mean to say you can't give them good advice. But affliction is used obviously there in the sense of being brittle to them, harsh to them. And they cry all unto me. God says, I'll hear them. Even if you don't. Well, this is a perfect example of that. This one cried because her husband was lost. And her husband had been a good member of the school of prophets in which they lived. I suppose it means that the next door neighbours would have probably been sons of prophets as well. Because they seem to have been in groups, didn't they? That uh, earlier chapter, chapter 2, seemed to imply that there was a group here in Gilgal, and another in Bethel, and another in Jericho, and so on. Samuel's arrangement seems to suggest, too, that that was the case. Well, she said, my husband's been a good member. He supported the cause, and he's been very helpful. But I'm single. And I'm in real trouble. What's your problem? The creditor has come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. 
That's like the last things that I have. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? She said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. I don't know how you read that. I feel almost criminal to read that, thinking of all the things that are in our houses. We've got this for that, and goodness knows the stuff we've got in our homes. We put extra rooms on now, and our homes will get bigger and bigger, so we can fit all these extra things, everything that you can imagine. We don't understand her circumstances, do we? It's hard enough to imagine how Grandma and Grandpa used to get on. And they're humble dwellings. It is for me anyway. But they did. They lived on very simple lives. They're marvellous people. Absolutely marvellous people. Well, she was very low. Came to the point where when the creditor came round, said, listen, you said the same thing last week and the previous week. This week, pay up. And she hasn't got anything to pay with. Well, what do you think is going to happen to those two sons? They'll be next, won't they? That's all she's got. What about when you have to pay for your, for your account with your children? Just stop and think about that for a minute. You have to pay your account. This fellow is banging on the door and he's been doing it for two months. And every time you come, there's some reason why you just didn't have any, anything left. He says, all right, son number one. Later on, it's son number two. No one to help her? We don't understand a life so simple, do we? Because all the public system would sort of step in and, and do something about that. But that's how it was for her. And he said to her, well, what shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And the lady had to say, I have a pot of oil. That's all I've got. A pot of oil. How much in today's costs? Might be five dollars, perhaps ten. That's all she's got. Look through the cupboards. I was going to say cupboards. They wouldn't know what a cupboard was, would they? It's all like hooks and things. But you could look through the hole and there's nothing. There's just nothing there that she could sell. Again, I don't understand that, my dear brothers. Just, I feel almost immoral to be speaking about the story because our circumstances are just so different, aren't they, to that today. What did he say? There was something that could be done. Go, he said, Borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbours. But they're not going to give her a bottle of oil. Costs something. They're not well off either. Go borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbours. Even empty vessels. What good's that going to do? And borrow not a few. Now, if I was one of those two boys and the mum said to me, look, I want you to go next door and, and ask for old bottles. If I was 10 or 12 or 8 or something like that, I'm sure I'd be pretty embarrassed to go and knock on the door and say, look, um, have you got any old bottles? There was a time when we used to hear the bot bottle man come. That would be sort of news to this current generation. But there used to be matter of people that would come around with a great big truck and it was full of bags of bottles. And as he would have gone, he'd call out and say, bottles, bottles! And the suburb would come out and bring out their bottles to the bottle man. I'm sure some... Did you have that in Canada? You did, yeah. It was a different age, wasn't it? But she was down to the point where the children had to go and do that. How would, how would the kiddies go? More than that, the prophet said, look, don't just ask for one. Borrow not a few. Now, you imagine young Jimmy 
picking up a bottle and he's eight years of age and he's sort of not knowing what to really say to these adults next door. How does he feel? He feels like he wants to get out of here as quick as he can because he's embarrassed by it. But the prophet's saying, ask them if they've got another one. And then go back after and ask them if they've got any more. Borrow not a few. When would you say to the child, well, that's enough? Whatever are we get, Bob, getting all these bottles together for? At least we had a clean kitchen before we started this up. But now it's a mess. And now you still, still now going to get bottles? Oh, that would be enough, surely. Whatever does Elisha mean? So it was actually a matter of faith, wasn't it? Do what Elisha says, the man of God, that you know he's the man of God, and he wins battles by a mere word of direction. He can bring the difference, life and death in circumstances. He can do what Elijah used to do. If he says, borrow not a few, then take his word. He's not going to take it out of his back pocket or write a check. Prophets didn't do that. But he said, don't borrow a few. So there's a test of faith in that, wasn't it? The child comes back and says, now I can go out and play. But mum says, no, 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 no. Go up that road too and ask and see if you can get some bottles up that road. I suppose this is what happened. It'd be something like this, wouldn't it? And the kitty after a while would be saying, oh, mum, come on. What are we doing with all these bottles anyway? They're not even cleaned up. And out he went again. And I don't know how many bottles he would end up with. But if what the um, record is saying, that he was to continue at it, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, whatever we... And thou shalt set aside that which is full. You don't have to sort of stop doing it when you've got one that's full. Go on to the next one. And the next one. And when do you stop? When the last bottle's full. So that's why they're told to go and get a lot of bottles. <laughs> And I think it's really, really interesting here to see this as a family matter. It is. These two boys have to share mum's disposition. She's lost her support. And the boys step partly into what dad would otherwise do. And they become therefore identified with their single mother. <laughs> single mother. And they respond to her predicament. Can you think of couples in your meeting or another meeting that are like that? The children are usually pretty useful children, aren't they? I can think of people like that. Some people in my own meeting <coughs> tower, tower in my estimation. My sister has four or five children. They're all in the truth. Well and truly. Two feet right in the truth. Another one has uh, two outstanding sons, outstanding boys, young and experienced. One of them's recently been appointed as an arranging brother. And the other one, he runs the music of Adelaide. And that's a fair job. And he's got a marvellous spirit. Or well, they were brought up in circumstances not unlike this. But somewhere or other, she was offered a bottle of oil and she took it. And when she had her sons, they came into the Sunday school. And there was all kinds of difficulties because her husband was totally opposed, totally opposed. He couldn't say a nice word about Christadelphians or about the truth. She went there with the smiliest of intentions you would get scars from him. 
It was just part of how it was. She put up with that for 25 years. Had an arrangement with her husband as to what she was doing, and she stuck to it. Bible class, always there. Sunday night, perhaps, it's not so easy. Her husband wasn't in the truth, and she had to sort of run her life. But it can happen, can't it? People, you know people like that. What a marvellous example they are. What's made it like that? Why does it succeed in some cases? This little beautiful story here is the success story, and it's as simple as ABC. The children cooperated. In a peculiar way, it says in verse 4, When thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee, and only she and the boys would see what happened. Isn't that beautiful? It was a cooperative with mum. And the boys therefore responded to that. I'm sure they did. But they still didn't know what was going to happen, did they? But she kept pouring and it kept coming out. And she said, another bottle, please. And they gave another bottle. I don't know how long it went on. Do you think that it, they got 50 bottles? How big were the bottles? Was it 100 bottles? That's a lot of money. In those days, every bottle was you know, privately made or personally made. So it's a lot of work, isn't it? A lot of bottles. It's expensive. She's got all, got all the, the bottles of the, of the whole street in her house. And there might have been some of the neighbors that watched what was going on and said, you know that kid there, he, he was at our place here just the other day and he was after bottles. Now so he's got in over there. They haven't got tuppence between them. What's this kid doing? All that would have happened as well. Doubts about the motive. And any child feels that, feels what the public feeling is. Well, they brought them in the side of the house and that's where the knowledge of it stopped. With mum that was left as the tutor and provider and these children. This is an elevating story, isn't it? Most wonderful story. They're cooperating together, two boys, not arguing, they're actually cooperating with mum. And they don't know how, but they think this is going to keep them alive. That's the power of the story. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, verse 5, who brought the vessels to her. It's almost... Dragging out the statement, isn't it? Of course that's what happened. Shut the door upon her, upon her sons. Mum and the sons. Six and eight perhaps, or eight and ten, who knows. Who brought the vessels to her. Of course it's those two boys. Why tell us that again? Because the record is asking us to think how moving that is that a mother that's left with nothing else. You can look at all of her... I was going to say her cupboards. All of her rooms. They've got written over them poverty. The very least. Their beds are very ordinary, if they had a bed. And somebody came in last week and took some piece of furniture and the week before and so on too. She's left with almost nothing in her house. Got two boys and a lot of bottles. And then she starts to pour. I suppose the boys would watch that, wouldn't you? You would. You think, hey, just a minute, you empty the, the, the flask, but the flask is full again. And away they went with a few more bottles. Boys would have really enjoyed that. Always love a bit of activity, don't they? And they'd be telling mum how many it is. And it's got up to 150. Well, I don't know how many it was, but I hope it was. Because this is going to really put a foundation in their life from here on. She had to provide for them a living. And they shut the door when they did it. 
there wasn't a matter of the, the neighbours sort of slipping in there and saying, do you want to have a game of, of Monopoly? Or do you want to have a, this or have a that? These boys, because of the family necessity, were doing what they were asked to do by their mother and they had the wisdom to do it. It's probably strong will like all boys. And mum played her card. She knew this was preservation or complete loss. But she closed the door. She said, you don't need other influences. I want you to concentrate on what is happening. And boys only look at a thing for, for a fairly short time normally, don't they? They want action. But the fact was that oil just kept on coming. Didn't matter how many bottles you filled. It kept on coming. What did she feel like, my dear brothers and sisters, when that happened? Another full bottle. Oh, it's still coming. Hey, it's still as full as it was before. Why well, another bottle? How long were they like then? Working on these bottles till the place was full of full bottles. Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, I don't know that he is, I suppose that was the older of the two boys. And he said unto her, there is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. That's why Elisha had said, said to her, look, don't be you know, deferring on this. You go and get as many bottles as you possibly can. Not a few. Do you understand? I really mean not a few. I want you to get as many as you like. So embarrassments and difficulties were not to really count. She had to have trust in that word that the prophet of God had said. Isn't that powerful to us? Because there's many times that we're pouring out from the bottle and into the blessings of God we've been given a little chart and it has daily readings on it. It's not the only thing we read, of course. But I think that's such a beautiful thing that Robert Roberts thought of. I just wonder where we would have been if he hadn't. What if we were all reading different stuff and we never had a charter to get through the scriptures? I'll guarantee there'd be 20% of the chapters in the Bible we would never have read. Hey? Eh? That chapter that we dealt with just before this. Who's read that and really got the hang of it before? It's difficult, isn't it? A little strange. Completely different our circumstances. And quite often you come across sections of scripture at my age, and you still think, oh, that's really interesting. <laughs> I've never really worked that out properly. And then you can't wait to see somebody to tell them about it. But what if we didn't know those corners of the scriptures? The unique thing of a Christadelphian understanding is that he does know the corners. He's gone through all of those passages, even Chronicles. Again this year, wasn't it? Eh? Took a while to get through some of those chapters and the children would just stumble over the big names and you think to yourself, does it really matter if they do or they don't? You might say that. But the concept of the chapter will have some value for them. The fact that there is a genealogy written which tells us it all went back and it had a beginning. It's rooted in facts. If you haven't got a full Bible then you may not think it is facts. They just wrote up what they wanted to write up. Made it a story and called it Christianity in the world. It. Yes, you can't do that with Adam and Eve. You can't do that with Moses and Joshua. You can't do that with the prophets. You can't do that with the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't do that with his resurrection. He did rise from the dead. And the world heard it, heard it and was persuaded by it. I even got holidays out of it. And because it came from the dead, they had Easter holidays. And they all keep Easter. Well, keep Easter. They like to have the fun that goes with Easter as they see it today. But it's buried in our calendar, isn't it? It didn't happen for nothing. It only ha happened because... It was recorded in Scripture and you could name the passages in the Old Testament which said it was going to happen. I shall not leave his soul in hell, neither his 
body with no corruption. Psalm 16 and many, many other passages because we go through all the Bible, don't we? And we don't mind doing that with our children. But it means too that our children have to know why we are pouring the bottle. They've got to know how to do it. They've got to know why we're doing it. It's for life. It's for their, their lives as it was for these boys' lives. It was going to keep them alive. They might have some batch of studies to do to keep up, to get a job. I understand. But nothing in our lives, in our family lives, should take the place of the Bible. Kick them out if they're not helping your family because you want your children's lives. Do what we should do by conscience and spend time with them. Talk to them. Love them, but make sure that they know where you stand. That's old Pat today, I know. And if I was to say that in certain quarters, I'd be consider considered to be an extremist. It's no extreme. No extreme at all. The best days of a family are when they're reading those scriptures together. And later on, they come to realise that. Some years ago, my... Brother Jim was uh, celebrating, I'm not sure just what part of the family it was, but all the children, married children, were all around. And uh, you can have some real interesting nights like that, can't you? Because in five or ten years, there's a lot of things that happen. Well, they're all married now, and they were all enjoying this time at home together and the children were occupied in, in uh, other ways. And so they got to telling stories like children like to, you've got to get them pretty relaxed to, to say the really, really interesting stories. Though. What did they do then? Lad? What did they do then? <laughs> you always wonder about those things, don't you? Well, it was on. And once the, the break was on, these stories kept on coming. And you and Leslie sat there and the faith got bigger and bigger and bigger until eventually Jim said to them, tell me, he said, how are you here? However are you here? And the oldest son said, Dad, because of the readings, That ought to be enough, brothers and sisters. Enough for all of us. Because it's true. Jim had some children that were not easy at all. I seen him with tears in the morning. Because teenagers can be a real difficulty to you. Can't they? Not always, but some particularly. It's just the assortment that you have. What a powerful thing that is. The oldest boy said, because of the readings there, Jim could make things interesting. He did know his Bible. He did know all the little corners of the scriptures, so to speak. And he had something to say on almost anything that was turned up. He did. He said his goal when we were young boys together, that we would know every page of the Bible and be able to, to make good sense of it. I can remember him saying something of that nature, and we agreed together. <coughs> There's no better agreement you could ever make is there, than that. But do we do it? Or do we go for buttons and pictures and shows and stories? And the story of the lady that poured the oil in the bottle gets forgotten. And other things crowd in and take the main picture. Are we as Christadelphians going back to the bottle of oil and ensuring that our children know the scriptures and how they are wonderful and how they're inspiring and they can then pass it on to their children? 
Well, there are some wonderful lessons in this brief little story that is here. It came to pass when the vessels were full, verse 6, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. But you can't drink oil, can you? You've got to do something with the oil. So these children then became sellers of the oil, which in our interpretation becomes that they learn to talk to the, the boys next door about the truth or the friends that they might have in the, some course they're doing or wherever they are in life. They know how to sell the oil. But the oil was going to pay the debt. He said, go and sell the oil and pay thy debt. That's what the man of God said. Have you notice that that term man of God keeps on coming in the, up in these pages? That was the term that was given to the prophet, man of God. It's in Ezekiel up too, isn't it? But it's interesting, right through all this record, you'll see it pop up all over the place. The man of God, that's the equivalent of the prophet. And that's what our children learn to do. They learn to be able to pass the truth onto others. And in young folks' circles, they can be among those young folks' circles and helping perhaps your child or my child because they know where they're going. And people in the group like that are so valuable. What would be the answer to their lives? It would be because a mother and a father sat down and really went through that with their children and made it live and lived it in their life. So later on, their son will say, because of the readings, Dad. Time had passed enough for Jim to realise that that was absolutely the core of it. He was quite as active as any other lad. He didn't sit around too much. But despite all of that activity, the simple sitting down to read the record of Scripture was what put that family and many other families on the right course. I think it's just a, a glorious little picture. It's only seven verses. It's said among different things here, aren't they? <laughs> Look at the previous chapter. No comparison whatsoever. <laughs> totally different picture altogether. That was Elijah's life. And our life takes different pat patterns at different stages too, like this. But underneath it all is that basic fact of the readings, the comprehension of the Word of God, making it interesting to our children. Moses sketched it all out, didn't we? Spoke about it many, many times through the years. When you're going along the path, when you're walking with your children, when you're in the countryside, what a classic opportunity today. They're trying to stuff evolution down their throats in every course. There are cases in Australia, cases in Adelaide, where we've had children that have come home from a course that they're doing in, in this case it was optometry, and the first lesson from this uh, professor that was giving the, the lesson, he says, uh, is there anybody in this hall, he says, that, uh, that believes in creation? And a few hands went up, just three or four. He says, you're in the wrong place. This is not made for you. You're in the wrong place. All right, he got upbraided by the university authorities. It got back to them. Do you know what he did the next day? He did exactly the same thing. They couldn't care less. Their heads are so swollen with pride that they've ceased to have any recognition of Scripture. And the Bible's put in many universes as a, play, as a book that you'd never want to read. Well, are we in the last times, my dear brothers and sisters? Do we need the pot of oil? Is the challenge of our lives to teach our little children that? All of it. To love the truth. To love their parents and appreciate the things that they have. Enormous lessons. Enormous lessons. Go sell the oil 
and pay thy debt and live. Thou and thy children of the rest.